So here we go. Now that's who I am. And um, that Center for Families, Children, and the Court is actually a section of the administrative office of the courts in California where a number of attorneys and other staff have an office within the larger administrative office of the courts. And we provide technical assistance to each and every court around the state. And that's what I do when I go out and sit down with judges in one of our 58 counties. So I'm on the road a lot. It's kind of like a, a little, little road show. And you drive into a, a rural county with 10,000 people in it and go to the courthouse and there are two judges doing everything. Or you go to Los Angeles where they have 22 judges just doing dependency. So talk about a state with a little bit of everything. And I sit down with people and I say, gee, have you ever thought about this? Or I just take notes and say, you are doing this so well, I've got to tell other people about it. Because every jurisdiction I've been into, whether it be in California or somewhere else, is like going into a foreign country. Everybody's got his or her own culture, their own way of doing it, and their own pride in what they're doing. I have a great job. I invented it. I wrote a letter to the Chief Justice when I was retiring. Uh, and, and I said, this is what I'd like to do for you on a half-time basis. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> so here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to overview court, uh, court improvement. Where are we today in court improvement? We're going to talk about reasonable efforts, how judges can build better court systems. Uh, we're going to talk about the drug court model. I know you do some of that here. I have a short film on that. We're going to talk about group decision making, which is really cool and other innovations and in where we headed. <clears throat> so this is a very exciting time in child welfare. What have we got? We've got focus on child welfare from the executive branch, from Congress and state legislatures. We've got national organizations. We've got foundations. We've got media. We've got volunteers and the courts. And we're all paying more attention to child welfare. Thank goodness. Now, this is a quick overview of the federal legislation. You're familiar with most of it. And now here are some pieces of federal legislation that are pending, including one from one of your local uh, congressmen, uh, Congressman McDermott. And if you're not familiar with this law, I want you to get behind it. I want you to support it. Now you say, gee, who can support federal le uh, legislation? What you do is you call the offices of your congressman. We're doing it in California. We're going to try to get every California congressman behind this bill because it would improve the child welfare system for the nation, but for your state is included. Okay, now the executive branch of government has its own initiatives. And we've got the um, Child and Family Service Reviews. CFSR. I'm going to talk about those today. They are a big deal. They can cost your state millions of dollars if you do not perform to the national standards. You've already had a CFSR and you flunked it. But don't feel bad. All 50 states flunked. They all created PIPs, Program Improvement Plans. And guess what? They're coming back again. Talk about more of that later. We got the Green Book Initiative. It has to do with the intersection of domestic violence, child protection, and the Juvenile Dependency Court. We've got the Family Drug Courts out of SAMHSA, BJA, and HHS. There's money coming out of these places, by the way, for your drug courts. I hope you all have a grant making capacity here in Washington. Get a lot of money from the federal government if you are on the ball and grab the, those grants when they pop up on your, on your computer. Safe Start, Victims Act, and court improvement. We were talking about that at breakfast today. Court improvement's been about 10 years old now. You have a court improvement project in Washington. All states have a court improvement project and have for 10 years. Money comes from the federal government. You're expected to do something with it to improve dependency courts. 
Wow, the federal government supports state courts. Unheard of. And yet it, ha it happened. And it's part of what this conference is about. OJJDP, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, also provides money, including it funds the model court project that you're a part of. So even though you think about OJJDP as doing on the delinquency side, it actually has a big investment in dependency also. Here are the key issues that seem to me to be on the federal agenda. Adoptions, educational outcomes for foster youth, stability for youth transitioning out of the foster care system, case management and data collection. You got a big grant last year for that, by the way. State of Washington did through your CIP. Child protection, domestic violence in the juvenile court, family drug courts, and improving implementation of the ICPC. <sighs> Can it ever be improved? Is it possible? <laughs> So we've got national foundations, and all of these foundations and more, but these foundations are giving big money to child protection, to child welfare, to even to the courts. And the Pew Commission probably had the largest impact of all. For two years, a high-level, prestigious group of people met around the country and wrote the Pew Commission report, which talked essentially about how the courts can improve and how funding can be improved for the child welfare system. And one of their recommendations was that each state form a Pew Commission statewide. We call ours the Blue Ribbon Commission. And we issued our draft report last month. And you can get a copy of that report. You ought to go and take a look at it. Consistent with what I'm saying to you today, the number one issue in California, as in most states, not all states, but most states, is resources. And we are essentially saying to our legislature, although the, the Judicial Council, the governing body of the courts in California, hasn't adopted it yet. It's still draft, but they're going to adopt it, I'm sure. Is saying we need more judges in dependency court. We need more attorneys in dependency court. We need to pay the attorneys more money to make it a career and not a training ground for more important and more prestigious work elsewhere. Yes? How do you attract judges to do this kind of work? We so often have reluctant judges. Judges, because they're uncomfortable, for example, terminating parents' rights, or they don't want to hear these awful things that happen to children. And it, 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 there are certain judges definitely that have thrown themselves into that work, but it's a small percentage of our judges. What do we do to attract judges who are not only willing to be involved in dependency work, but also provide leadership? The um, question is about how do you attract judges to do this work? And that really brings up a whole separate talk, doesn't it, about why do judges want to do anything that has to do with families. <laughs> families get in front of you, they squabble, and I'm speaking about domestic relations court too. It's, it's all usually a tie about which is the least desirable job in the, in the court system, domestic relations or juvenile dependency. Juvenile delinquency is a notch above a notch above, because criminal court judges are pretty comfortable doing delinquency. And uh, when I started my career back in the 80s, I said I'd like to go to juvenile court. I was a juvenile court judge for more than 20 years. And in California, which is a rotation state, that's unheard of. But nobody else wanted the job. And I would go to the next presiding judge, and I said, I want to stay. And they said, you do? You've done your time. <laughs> you can leave now. And I said, I don't want to leave. And then I started writing, and I started writing. One of my principal points in writing is you can't rotate juvenile court judges in every six months as it used to be, or a year or two years. You can't do that. Because what you're doing is you're short shrifting the juvenile court system. I will talk about that more later. So how do you attract judges? Well, first of all, you find, I write the governor every year and say, I want you to appoint people to the bench who come out of family and juvenile law. 
And that's difficult to do because those are not your high-profile lawyers like your district attorneys or your, your civil attorneys, and they certainly don't give money to anybody. But little by little, we have found that more and more people find this a calling. And whereas when I started, I was the only person who wanted the job, they are lined up in my court, my former court, to take the job that I had. They're lined up. And I think one part of it is that they're mostly women. And as, as women get more involved in the work of the courts, and they go from 0% when I joined my court to 40% as it is today, I think you're going to find more interest in that. But it's partly recruitment, it's partly selection, and it's partly making it a more prestigious job by making it not the sweatshop that it is in many courts, where you just are overwhelmed with numbers, but a court where you can take enough time with each case to have the kind of impact you want, and there's no more impactful court than the Juvenile Dependency Court. There's no more important court than the Juvenile Dependency Court. But we have used it as a backwater, oh, let's send a couple of people out there to take care of the kids. And so the, the answer is complex, it takes time, but I'm telling you from my experience that it happens. And so don't lose spirit on this. We're definitely getting better in terms of judges showing an interest in a career, a substantial portion of their career in juvenile court. Um, and by the way, just to let you know what's, what's in the future, California has decided, its judicial council, that they're going to put judges in juvenile and family court and not commissioners. And you say, well, how about that? Because commissioners, they just, they're hired. They're court em employees in one extent, to one extent. So as a commissioner retires, that position is removed and a judge comes in. So we're going to face that problem more seriously than you think. Because we have, just as you have done for years, had most of our family and juvenile courts have been um, run by commissioners. How about national organizations? National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, you have representatives in the room here today. They are your friends. They will provide technical assistance. The Child Welfare League of America also, they will give grants. These, these groups will come in for free, the National Center for State Courts, ABA, um, the Council for Children. All of these organizations provide TA for you once you put your house in order so that you can say, we want somebody to come in and talk to us about this issue. Which of these national organizations will do it? And actually, all of them could probably do most issues. And they'll come out here and they'll work with you on those issues. And those three also. Unfortunately, if you invite the Youth Law Center in, they may sue you on the, also. But that's, you know, that goes with the turf. Um, and we have the Permanency Planning Department at the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and that is the group that you'll be working with as, with the model courts, and they produce the resource guidelines. And the resource guidelines are the Bible. They're the starting point for a juvenile dependency court. They were written about 13 years ago. And they, the title tells what they're about. They are telling courts around the country, if you are going to have a good juvenile court, here are the resources you need including here's how much time you should spend on hearings. Like in an initial hearing, your shelter care hearing, they want you to spend one hour. All right, if you're not shocked at that, then I've come to the wrong place. And of course you're shocked. And we used to have these debates between uh, Sharon McCulley from Salt Lake City and Judge McCulley's the presiding judge there, and she spends an hour on her hearings. And Bill Gladstone, Judge Gladstone from Miami, Florida, and he, he used to get about 20 of those little hearings in one hour. And, and, they, and he used to just laugh at these resource guidelines. But they are aspirational. They are setting the standard of where we should be. We should spend time up front, and you'll hear more about that. Model Courts Project, you are now a model court. Congratulations, by the way. I, I guess Judge Clark had a hand in that, getting you in the model courts. Oh, yeah. Right on. We've been a model court, as I say, for a little more than 10 years, and it's changed my life. 